will go ahead and hire up the team. Thank you. So um, I apologize from the beginning if this doesn't flow as well as the other talks. Um, I had a little short of time to prepare. And uh, I, I will need to sometimes switch between slides and some numbering of the slides are not correct. So, but hopefully everything else is, will work fine. So as Neil said, I'll be talking about Siemens Coalition for hierarchical representation. Um, so first I'll tell you what I mean by hierarchical representations, then I'll tell you what I mean by Siemens Coalition, and then um, talk about how to, how to construct models using Siemens Coalition and um, how to sample from the prior, how to generate data from this model, um, and then how to do inference and then some application. So hierarchical representations are everywhere. Uh, you're probably familiar with the evolutionary tree. Uh, this is one very prominent model of, uh, of hierarchies basically, or one prominent way of using hierarchies to represent the uh, life basically. Or uh, you probably also know the language tree, so the languages are related to each other. There, there are language families and um, there are bigger family families and so on. So languages, some languages are more related to each other than other languages and so on. So uh, people came up with this kind of a tree to represent the relationship between languages. Uh, you may also be interested in simply visual taxonomies rather than um, the genetic relationship between things. Uh, you may just want to organize things in terms of their visual appearances so that uh, when you see a particular color of bird, for example, uh, you go to this taxonomy and you, you scroll through this taxonomy to find um, the, the class of bird that you're looking for uh, rather than having to sort through all the birds and having to look at them one by one. So uh, another use of hierarchical representations therefore is to um, represent the data in a good format to be able to search uh, quickly through it. There's some ringing in the microphone. Is that? Okay, I hear it. Um, so, uh, wh why do we want to do hierarchical clustering or hierarchical representation? Um, as I said, you, you may want to discover underlying structure in the data when we believe that the data has an underlying tree structure, like in modeling genealogies or in modeling um, language families. Or we may simply want to visualize data to understand the relationship among data items. Um, or we, we may simply want to summarize data uh, and use hierarchical representations as a way to uh, partition data into different, possibly unrelated groups. Are you okay? Is that, is that fine? Okay. Um, so, um, and these, these um, <coughs> goals may be that doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. So you may want to discover the underlying structure in the data to be able to uh, visualize it better, for example, and so on. So the hierarchical representations gives us, uh, gives us shorter search time. It gives us a more intuitive relationship between groups of data points as opposed to flat clustering where uh, the only output you would have is the relationship between the items lying in the same cluster. Uh, in hierarchical clustering, you would have different um, different amount of variability between different uh, groups of clusters because they, they are lying under a tree, for example. Um, and there is more structure in the representation, uh, so you may be able to capture more information about the data. So even if the data does not naturally come in a hierarchical form, you may still uh, get a better representation, but, um, a better model of the data by using hierarchical models. And it's easier and nicer to visualize. Okay, so 
In this talk, I'm using particle clustering and particle representations interchangeably. Basically, I'm using the same type of model, Kingdom's Coalition, for doing both. Particle representations is something more general than hierarchical clustering, but I'll, uh, for ease of presentation, I'll be focusing on hierarchical clustering when I uh, describe the things. So um, there are different ways that were developed to do hierarchical clustering. Uh, I think the most prominent one is the traditional agglomerative clustering, where uh, you compute, you define a distance between data points and the distance between clusters of data points, and um, you iteratively start from the bottom, iteratively uh, construct the tree um, by comparing the distances and um, combining the clusters of data points until you get to the root. Um, another method is probabilistic agglomerative clustering, uh, where you define a probability distribution over data points or groups of data points, and you have a, a different criterion this time rather than distance. You you use this um, you use something like this. Um, so the probability of the joint um, of Q and R, as opposed. Uh, um, the ratio of that with probability of Q alone and R alone. So um, which, whichever pair of cluster has um, a higher score, then you merge this and again, you iteratively um, go until the top. So um, these methods assume some probability distribution, but uh, they don't, they don't um, model the data, the generative process that generated the data as a probability distribution. So there are methods that have uh, done that as well. So uh, these authors um, have defined a probability distribution over trees and then uh, defined a tree structured likelihood and try to do inference um, to, to get the posterior of the trees uh, given the data points. So I'm going to be focusing on these types of models. Actually, uh, this work by Thea Toll is uh, the work which uses the Kingdom's coalescent as a prior over trees to construct this model. Um, so, as I said, in, in Bayesian hierarchical clustering, we use a tree structured graphical model as a data generating process. Um, and we define a prior to compute the posterior over trees. And as a prior over trees, we use Kingdom's coalescent. So why do we want to do Bayesian hierarchical clustering and uh, why do we want to use Kingdom's coalescent for that? Um, it's because first we want a hierarchy because the hierarchical representation um, is more powerful than flat representation. Uh, the reason why we want to use Kingdom's coalescent for, for the prior is because it admits efficient and relatively easily implement, imp implementable inference algorithms. <laughs> it's the topic of this talk and I'm going to come to it. So for now, just think of it as a distribution over binary trees, okay? Okay, um, and this method in inherits the advantages of Bayesian approaches, um, such as it can handle the notion of uncertainty over tree structures. It has meaningful branch length. It has a well-defined objective function and it can deal with missing data. And I'll come to this point as well, but this is uh, one of the most important points in using Kingdom's coalescent. Um, it produces infinitely exchangeable models uh, and therefore it has predictive semantics. I'll come to that point later. <coughs> okay, so a bit more detail about the structure of the models. So as I said, we, we're going to use a tree structured likelihood and a prior over trees to um, formulate the whole model. The likelihood will be a Markov process that's defined on the tree that evolves forward in time. So given, given a tree like this, where we have data on the leaves, we generate the data by starting at the, at the root, uh, going towards the leaves along the branches of the tree, and we define a Markov process that runs on this tree uh, that transitions uh, the, the data points along the branches to different types. 
And um, the prior that we will assume is Klingmann's coalescence. Okay, so what is Klingmann's coalescence? It's a model of population. So it was um, proposed in population genetics to model the populations in order to be able to uh, study certain things about population, such as the genealogy or the mutation rate or the effective population size or so, and so on. And it's a very prominent model in population genetics. It's, it's one of the uh, most important models in population genetics. Um, so Kingman's coalescence assumes that each individual has exactly one parent. So therefore, it's a haploid generation. Uh, um, and therefore, the genealogy of a population of individuals is a tree. Okay, so this is one assumption that's not very realistic of, for example, uh, human population, but uh, there are extensions to uh, this um, basic model. But in this lecture, we're only going to consider this type of trees, okay? And uh, this type of hi hierarchies. We're not going to consider any, graph any other graphical structure than trees. Um, so Kingman's coalescence, can be obtained as an infinite limit of the right Fisher model, which is also a model from population genetics. And um, this model starts off by saying, uh, again, assuming haploid organisms. And it, it also assumes non-overlapping generations and that each generation has an individual. So uh, each circle <coughs> here represents an individual and each column is a generation and um, ignore this for the moment. So there are n generations at the population and there are several generations. And uh, in this model, um, we measure time between generations as one over n, where n is the population size, okay? Um, and the right Fisher model says each individual chooses a parent uniformly randomly from the previous generation. So these arrows show the parents that individuals choose in the previous generation. So if you, if you go backwards in time and um, basically uh, let every individual choose his parent uniformly randomly from the previous generation, and then you focus on a subset of the population, you see that if you go enough back in time, then uh, all individuals in that subset is going to coalesce into one common ancestor, okay? So just to take it more slowly, we have a population of size n, and we start at time zero, and at the next generation, again, we have a population size of n, and now we're at time minus one over n, and so on, right? So we're going backwards in time, and at at each generation, each individual chooses a parent uniformly randomly from the previous generation. Uh, therefore, the, there, there will be some overlap between the uh, parent of some individuals, but, uh, and, and therefore some individuals will not be chosen. And if we carry this on until um, ancient pa past, And as I said, if we focus on a particular subset of individuals, and if we trace their ancestry back to ancient past, then we see that no matter what subset we chose, it's going to coalesce at uh, one single common ancestor, okay? So this is what the right Fisher model says. So we arrive at Kingman's coalescence when we take n to infinity, so when we take the number of individuals in the population to infinity, um, note that we were measuring time in terms of one over n, the time between generations. So when we take n to infinity, the time between generations go to zero. So this becomes rather than a discrete time process, discrete time process over finitely many individuals, it becomes a continuous time process over infinitely many individuals. Okay? So we basically then, um, if we look at this tree, then we can represent that tree 
like this, where now the branches um, represent infinitely many generations in between a particular child and its ancestor. Okay, so when I represent this king of coalescent tree, um, the immediate parent in the graphical model sense, the immediate parent is actually not an immediate parent in genealogical sense, it's an ancestor, okay? So it's a shared ancestor. Um, so yeah, so to recap, King of Coalescent is a distribution over genealogical trees of the population. And it's assumed that each individual has exactly one parent. And uh, the nodes represent common ancestor and each branch represents multiple generations. So there are very important properties uh, for of King of Coalescent that, that is appealing to machine learning people uh, because it makes it fun to work with these models in practice and it makes it also possible to work with these models in practice. So uh, one important thing is that the coalescent times are independent from the tree structure. By tree structure, I mean who pairs up with who. So the way, the way uh, these trees are generated uh, from King of Coalescent, you can first sample who, gen who, who coalesces with who, who shares a common ancestor with who first, and then sample times. And um, you, you can do this separately. So and this makes it easier to uh, model these with these processes. Um, and the distribution over, over tree structures is simply uniform. So each pair of individual is equally li likely to coalesce with uh, each other. And it has two important self-similar properties. Uh, one of them is that if you, if you look at a Kingless coalescence sample, and if you integrate out a part of this, so you, you just get rid of uh, a, a part of the nodes, what you have remaining, the distribution of over the trees that you have remaining is still a kingless coalescent. And similarly, again, if you start off with a kingless coalescent tree uh, uh, at a particular time, and now you, you integrate over everything until this point, and now you look at trees only starting at this time, you still have the same distribution. So it's still a kingless coalescent, okay? So uh, these properties lead to infinite exchangeability, which is a property of, of Bayesian non-parametric models. You're going to hear more about Bayesian non-parametrics tomorrow uh, from Peter Orbans and I think from Julian as well. Um, but just, just to um, summarize briefly, basically uh, this infinite exchangeability, you can think of it as meaning um, it doesn't matter on which order you observe the data points, they're still going to, the distribution is still going to be the same. Plus um, you, can, you can marginalize out data points, you get the same form of distribution. You can add new data points, you get the same form of distribution. So um, therefore, the first thing I said, marginalizing out the data points and getting the same form of distribution allows us to use these models on finitely many data, but still be non-parametric. The second property of, of this, um, introducing new points and being able to still uh, stay in the same distribution allows us to be able to do predictions um, without having to change the models. Okay, so <coughs> this is what the prior from King of Coalescent looked like. So these are, this is time, and the time scale for all these plots are the same. Uh, and the number of leaves in all of these are increasing like this, okay? so. Um, you mean you mean in this picture? There are infinitely many generations in, in between, but um, well, when I was talking about integrating out, I was tr talking about like integrating out a part of the tree. So you 
You're right. There is also infinitely many things on, on this, but we don't have to represent them explicitly because the model doesn't even refer to that. But another thing that is infinite is actually there are infinitely many nodes as well, right? There are infinitely many leaves because we arrived at Kingman's coalescence, remember, as n goes to infinity where n is the population size. So, um, but when we have finitely many data, think of it as we have infinitely many nodes here, but we have only finitely many data, which is this subset, let's say. So when we model this, inf uh, this finite subset using Kingman's coalescence, effectively we're kind of integrating out everything that doesn't belong to that red, red tree denoted here. <coughs> okay, so, so this is what the, uh, these are some examples from the prior. And one thing to note is that although there is a lot more uh, leaf nodes here than here, the time scale is, or the time to the most recent common ancestor, or the root of the tree, is roughly uh, the same, right? It's on the same order of magnitude. So this is something very interesting uh, of Kingman's coalescence, and that's because, th this, this happens because the time to coalesce scales with exponential distribution or, um, with parameter n choose two, where n is the number of individuals in the current population, okay? So when we have less individuals, then, um, then it is the first coalescent time happens later, okay? And when we have more individuals, the first coalescent time happens much, much faster. So um, that's basically why we have such a structure. We, we, we have uh, the similar scaling in the, in the time for the most recent common ancestor. Uh, another thing that you probably noticed by looking at this, although we, we haven't observed any data and we, we haven't said anything about the data yet, already in the prior there's some kind of a clustering going on, right? So you see that some, some points are, some leaves are closer to each other uh, when you look at the length of the branches than other leaves, for example. So. Uh, this motivates us to use Kingman's coalescence for doing clustering because it has a naturally uh, occurring clustering property. Okay, so how do we sample? Is there a <coughs> question? Oh, okay, I thought yes. Okay, how do we sample from the prior of Kingman's coalescence? So as I mentioned earlier, um, the every pair of individual is um, uh, can, can coalesce with each other equally likely, right? And uh, Kimmel's coalescence assumes that every pair of the co um, every pair of individual coalesces at a time that is distributed with exponential rate one, uh, with, with parameter one, uh, and the pair with the shortest time coalesces. So, in order to be able to sample, what we can do is we we can sample times for every possible pairing of the data from exponential distribution with rate one, and then choose the one that has, a, that has the shortest coalescent time, which is this, in this pair, for example. Uh, so we coalesce them into a new ancestor. Um, so in the second stage, we again do the same thing. We sample for a, all remaining points, we sample um, a time from, again, exponential distribution one, because no matter at what time we start, again, this, the properties of the distribution doesn't change, right? Uh, so we sample times for all individuals from exponential rate one and choose the one with the shortest coalescent time to coalesce. We call that the winning pair. So the, the, the one with the shortest coalescent time wins the winning rate. And we have the coalescent tree. So another way to generate from the prior from the coalescence is using order statistics. So uh, I th as I said, uh, the each pair of individuals coalesce with exponential rate one, right? And there are n individuals, there are, therefore there are n choose two uh, pairs of individuals. So 
at iteration i, we have this many individuals. So now if we consider the ordered statistics of the exponential distribution, this is the, this is the first, this is, this is the short, the distribution of the shortest time to coalesce among uh, this many exponentials with rate one. So what we can do is we can simply sample the time from this dis distribution and pick a pair uniformly at random and then again remove coalesce pair at their parent repeat until everyone is merged. Yeah. Well, in the other one as well, because you're in this <coughs> one as well, because you're sampling from. Okay, I, I think that's a very good point. Kingman's coalescing uh, assumes binary trees. So the picture I showed you was from uh, Wright Fisher model. I think that you're referring to that one. Wright Fisher model doesn't um, assume binary trees. But now, because time is time is continuous, then there is zero probability for uh, more than t two individuals to coalesce at the same time uh, to the same parent. Okay, so yeah, it's always binary trees when it comes to Kingman's coalescent. Again, uh, there are extensions of Kingman's coalescent that assume that, that relax that assumption and can can have non-binary trees. Uh, but in this one, we, we always assume binary trees. Okay, so in this one, we picked a coalescent time from this distribution, uh, given the number of individuals. We coalesce them at the picked time, here let's say, and then we carry everyone to that time because they haven't coalesced yet, so we, we now have them all here. And we sample from Again, an exponential distribution, this time with, of course, different n because we, we have one less individuals. And we go on like this until we construct the full tree. Okay, so this is another way to sample from the Kingman's coalescent prior. And uh, the probability of the, of the sample from Kingman's coalescent has this probability. So the normalizing constant of the exponential distribution cancels out with the uniform distribution over pairs of individuals. Okay, so now we know how to sample from the prior. Let's see how we sample from the uh, for, for the data. Okay, so remember this was the Wright Fisher model, and we can again think of the data generation by first looking at the Wright, Wright Fisher model. So uh, individuals. So before individuals didn't have identities because they were from the prior, right? We were talking about the prior distribution. Now we're talking about the actual data generating process. So we, we can assume that data, the individuals may be of different types. So here color represents a type. And each child is basically a duplicate of the parent. Or uh, it goes under, under mutation and it uh, mutates into a different type, for example, this child is from this pink parent, but it is now yellow because it went under mutation, right? So if we go on like this, we see that although this subpopulation originated from the same Adam and Eve, there is still some variability among the population, okay, because of mutation. So that's what we do in Kingman's coalescent as well. We have this binary tree. We drop mutations along the tree branches. Dropping mutations mean um, we decide on where these mutations will happen by simply running a Poisson process down the tree. And then uh, we go along the branches, changing the type of the nodes at every mutation point according to the transition kernel, okay? Okay, so now we have a tree structured likelihood um, and we know how to generate the data. As I said, this is uh, just a Marco process that goes around the tree. So now we can generate different types of data. So the types of data that we generate will depend on the type of mutation process that we assumed. For example, uh, a, a particular 
genetic gen process can say uh, there is a photon process with uniform rate on the tree, and at each spike, it, it generates a completely new individual. So this is a model from population genetics um, that's called infinite alleles model. So every time there is a mutation, it is something completely different from the rest of the population because it samples from a continuous distribution. So one, one interesting connection is that the marginal distribution induced on the leaves has a Chinese re restaurant process partitioning structure. If you don't know about this yet, you're, you're going to learn about it later. Um, I think tomorrow, Peter Orbans is going to talk about it. Um, so you can just, for now, you can just uh, keep in mind that Kingman's coalescent has some relation to the Dirichlet process or the Chinese restaurant process as well. Another mutation uh, model you can think of is a multinomial mutation. Basically, we have a vector representing the data, and at each mutation event, uh, one of the dimensions of this data changes to something else, and what it changes to is encoded by the Markov transition kernel. Okay? So it changes to one of the uh, possible states with some probability that is encoded by the Markov transition kernel. And at the leaves, again, we have the data. This is another example. It doesn't all need to be discrete, so the data can be continuous as well, the data generated by this process. Um, for example, we can assume a Brownian motion. So let's say that the data starts at uh, at this time, zero. Um, so these are the values of the data point. So the, the nodes go under Brownian motion, and at every split point, the branches will go through independent Brownian motion, okay? So the locations where these points end up are uh, basically the data identities. And of course, you can think of uh, multiple dimensional Brownian motion as well. Okay, so now about inference. So as I said, we have, we have data at the leaves, which is generated by picking a particular parent, a particular most recent common ancestor, and uh, dropping mutations along the branches of the tree, and going along the branches and mutating this root nodes uh, according to the Markov transition kernel to get the data. Here, here these vectors represent, uh, basically, this is a one-dimensional di data with five possible states. Black represents the state that the data takes at that point in time, okay? So we start with this. Uh, this mutation caused it to transition to this state, and then this mutation caused it to transition it back to this state, and so on, until we get this state back here, okay? So this is still going forward. This is still data generation. And in inference, what we want is we observe these data at the leaves, and we want to go back and reconstruct this tree, okay? So when we do inference, we, we don't observe th this tree structure or the times of the mutations or anything like that, right? We don't, we don't observe anything but the data. So given the data, we want to go back and reconstruct the tree. And um, we, may, we may do this by basically trying to reconstruct every detail about the tree, including the tree structure, the time of when things happen, and call it the, the, the mutation events and uh, what these mutation events cause the, um, the data points to turn into and so on, right? But there will be lots of possibilities uh, for that, especially because time is continuous, there will be infinitely many possible trees, so that's not very feasible to uh, represent every possible tree. Uh, one class of models that try to do an inference on, on these class of uh, problems is basically uh, they, they don't represent these times, but they represent the coalescent and mutation events and what everything uh, mutates into and so on. But um, I'm going to talk about 
a different type of approach where we integrate our applications and we represent things in terms of uh, messages on the tree. So you can think of this as we represent uh, the state vectors as distribution over the, the nodes rather than these black and white vectors, okay? So we represent, we don't know what went on be in between these, uh, these data points, for example, but we know what the data looks like. So we know, uh, and the time that passed between uh, the, the observation of the data points and the coalescent event, right? Uh, so we, we can have an idea about what, what are the possible states and with, with what properties, for example. Okay, so this is the notation we are going to use. Uh, we have X data points at the lead, and we have these latent internal nodes, which we denote by Y, and the subscript denotes who coalesced to um, construct that Y. And we have a state that is sampled from the equilibrium distribution, basically a state that's in the distance path. Um, with pi, we represent the tree, and pi t is basically the partially constructed tree until time t. So we go from time zero uh, towards the past times, and uh, pi t tells <coughs> us the partitioning structure that we get of these data points until a particular time, for example, um, at this time, we would have x1 and y23 and y45 and so on. And um, coalescent events happen at times t0, t1, t2 and so on. And uh, the time lapse between consecutive coalescent events are shown by delta. Um, so here, th this denotes the transition kernel. So in order to be able to compute the probability of this whole thing, the, the data, the latent variables, and, and this Z, again, which is a latent variable, uh, which denotes the equilibrium state, we can simply use calculus, right? We can, we can say, okay, uh, the Markov transition kernels tell us how things turn into other things. So th this basically tells us what's the probability of going to a particular state if you're coming from a particular state, okay? And there are two children per parent, so this is the, that's why we have two things here. Um, and this comes from the transition, uh, the equilibrium distribution, and this is basically the probability of transition from the equilibrium distribution to the most recent common ancestor. You don't need to get all the details about these equations. It's just, I want to give uh, a high level view of uh, how we do what we do, but don't worry about the equation details. So basically what we do is we use, we use this equation, but we know that we haven't observed y or z, we only observed x. So we, we need to somehow get rid of y and z. So what we do is we integrate them out by using message passing. Again, if you're not familiar with message passing, don't worry about it. Uh, the only take home message from this whole slide is the fact that the probability of the data at the lead that we observe, given the particular tree that we have, is given as a product of these functions, okay? So the, these functions that I encoded with z and um, if you want to know details, we can talk up after the lecture. Um, but basically, this is the form of the, um, of the likelihood function, which we obtain by simply integrating out the, uh, the hidden variables. Okay, so we have all the ingredients we need, right? We have the likelihood, which is of this form, and we have the prior, which is of this form. So to get the posterior, we combine the likelihood and the prior. So the posterior is proportional to this here. So this comes from the prior and this comes from the likelihood. And there is a, so bo both the prior and the likelihood has this product over n minus one thing. 
because when we have n individuals at the start, then we have n minus one coalescent events until we get to the most recent common ancestor. Okay, so that's why we have n minus one terms in the flow diagram. So, and in the posterior, of course, when we combine these, we will have n minus one products, right? And um, one interesting observation is that this comes from the likelihood, uh, prior, this comes from the likelihood. So combining these, we will have the posterior. So although it's not exactly true, we can view uh, the i term here as like a local posterior, okay? And we use this observation to construct our proposal distribution to, to, do, inf to do inference, basically. So what, what we are going to do, do is we'll start at the leaf node and we'll propose an agglomerative algorithm that will iteratively construct the tree by proposing coalescent times and pairs to coalesce, okay? And for that, we need a proposal distribution and we're going to use this observation that uh, this is coming from the prior, this is coming from the likelihood, therefore, this is somewhat like at i's iteration, this i's product is somewhat like the local posterior. Okay, so just a very brief uh, recap, uh, or not a recap, a very brief uh, crash course for sequential Monte Carlo. Um, so who is familiar with Monte Carlo techniques or sequential Monte Carlo? Okay. <laughs> <coughs> so yeah, so you do have some background on it then. So important sampling is basically a, a technique where we want to sample from a particular distribution, let's say P, but it's hard to sample from it. We don't know how to sample from it or it takes too, too much time, too much computation time to sample from it. So what we do is we, we construct a proposal distribution, Q let's say, and we sample from Q rather than sampling from P. Uh, and we, we have some weights that tell us how important each of these samples are so that we weight the sample with these importance weights and some, some of these uh, sample cells to get the um, get the distribution that we're interested in. Sequential importance sampling is basically uh, a sequential way of doing importance sampling. The proposal distribution is constructed sequentially, hence the name sequential, uh, and the importance weights are also constructed sequentially. Okay, so because this is sequential it gathers more information over iterations about the data or about the model. Uh, therefore, some early samples may not be as representative as in earlier uh, iterations. So if you, if you started off with some samples that had high weights, uh, they, that looked like they are representative of the distribution that you want to represent. Uh, later on, at the, during, during sampling, these weights may shrink simply because you learn more things about the data and the data didn't tell you what your samples expected it to tell in the very beginning, so <coughs> some, some of the weights may shrink. So, uh, and this is called sample degeneracy. So the way to combat this is basically uh, having sequential Monte Carlo or sequential importance sampling re resampling. So what you do is you have the sequential importance sampling, you put on top of that, um, a resampling step, which basically means you look at the distribution of weights, you sample, uh, you sample the sample, or you you sample the generated points, let's say, uh, according to their weights, and you prune out the ones that didn't get picked, and you keep the ones that did get picked, so so that you have a better representation of your current data collection, okay? So that was the crash course to sequential Monte Carlo. Okay, so here what we're going to do is uh, we're, we're going to talk about two algorithms, one sequential Monte Carlo and one greedy, 
algorithm in detail. Um, and I'll also go over some, some other sequential Monte Carlo algorithms that are for post working on coalescing. Uh, one common aspect of all these uh, algorithms that I'm going to talk about is that we start off with leaves as our data points, right? So we start off with these data points and we iteratively construct this tree or construct sample trees, multiple, multiple of them if we're using sequential Monte Carlo, uh, that, that is representative of the uh, posterior trees that generated the data. Okay, so at each iteration, we need to decide which pair to coalesce and when to coalesce. That, that is going to be the question. So, uh, as I said, we're, we're going to use these, the term that comes from the prior and the term that comes from the likelihood. We're, we're going to take this and use that as the proposal distribution for for our sampling algorithm, okay? So th this, this algorithm uh, that was done by Satkin and Teodamer and Roy assumes that this is the proposal distribution and at each iteration, it samples a coalescent time from the prior and then let's say uh, these were our data points. Let's say we decided that they're going to coalesce here because that's the time that our prior told us to coalesce. Now we evaluate this, so because, because now this is fixed, right? Because now we have delta already, uh, the time to coalesce. So we have evaluate this at that time, and that gives us something that is like the probability of that particular pair to coalesce. So we do that for, we evaluate this for all possible pairs. We have a distribution like this for all possible pairs in the population. So these six tell you the probability, the proposal probability of coalescing for uh, a particular pair, another pair, another pair, and so on. So uh, from, from this distribution, we, we choose which pair to coalesce, and then coalesce that pair. Let's say we chose this pair to coalesce. We coalesce them at this point that we already chose from the prior. And now we have one less individual to worry about in the population, and we do the same thing iteratively until we get to the root of the tree, okay? Of course, we need to compute weights for the sequential Monte Carlo and we resample particles if weights diverge and if more than one point left, we repeat this whole thing and so on. But uh, these are all common for all, all sequential <coughs> Monte Carlo algorithms. So in, the important thing is how we propose things, okay? So another algorithm that was developed uh, by these guys again, is again using the same type of uh, local posterior as the proposal distribution. Um, but this time, rather than sampling times from the prior, what it does is it first chooses which pair to coalesce by again looking at some distribution of <coughs> probabilities for the pairs. And the probabilities for each pair is given by this integral. Basically, this is a proposal distribution for this pair, right? So, it, and uh, it's a distribution over time and over pairs. So uh, if we integrate out time from this, we have this, right? So we have, we have an expression that tells us, again, a proposal probability for a particular pair to coalesce, okay? so. We, we construct this one and we choose which pair to coalesce by sampling from this distribution. And then we sample the coalescent time for that pair from this distribution. It's basically going back to this, what we took the integral of. We, we, this time we have, we know which pair to do this for. So we, we sample a time for that pair and then again do the same thing that we did before, merge the pair into an endpoint, remove merging pa pairs from the representation, compute weights, resample, go on, okay? So again, the difference between this is, this is sampling times from the prior and then uh, sampling the pairs to coalesce given the time, right? And 
This is sampling a pair by evaluating this integral for every possible pair, and then sampling a time. Okay, so these are both uh, correct sampling algorithms, just a different take on the, the proposal distribution. So one thing they have in common though is that um, they're sampling a coalescent time for, uh, so th sorry, this is evaluating th this integral for every possible pair of uh, individuals at the uh, current iteration. And because this expression changes at every <coughs> iteration, it has to recompute everything, okay? So there is a uh, order of n squared pairs at each iteration, and there are n minus one iterations, so there, there is an order of n cubed uh, computations for this uh, algorithm. And this algorithm also has a cubic scaling, because although it's, uh, it's not doing that integral, which is, which is very costly, so this is uh, more cost effective, uh, still it is evaluating this value for every pair of individuals that exists at the current time, right? So again, there are n, n squared individuals and there are n on the order of n iterations. So <coughs> it, uh, the computations here is again cubic. So one way to scale up inference is basically uh, trying to avoid this cubic scaling and uh, focusing only on a subset of pairs. And the idea is to uh, focus on, on, on the similar points by using their, the similarity information between pairs of points. So we have, we have these individuals, right? And we are going to, again, use uh, the second algorithm, the, the uh, proposal distribution that is like the second algorithm. So this is the local posterior. And we'll integrate out the time so that we have the probability of coalescing for pairs of individuals. But the difference is we're not going to do that for every possible pair of individuals. We're going to do it only for a subset. So. This would have been the distribution if we were to do it for every possible pair of individuals. Rather than that, we're going to ignore this part. We're only going to do this computation for this part only. And we're going to decide who to do computations for by looking at nearest neighbors of individuals and uh, limiting the pairs to a subset of pairs. And, uh, if we want to use this in a sequential Monte Carlo scheme, then we need to make sure that these guys have a uh, positive probability of coalescing. So we're going to set their probability to coalesce to a constant that's not zero, okay? Let's say the length of this dotted line is going to be the probability for the other guys to coalesce, and the probability of these are going to be given by this integral here. So what we do, Okay, and uh, if we, if we uh, include more pairs, then we're going to have a uh, more efficient um, or be better representation of our, propo um, of our distribution that we actually want to sample from. Okay, so as I said, this is, this is how we obtain the speed up by, by ignoring some of the pairs not, not really ignoring, but by setting them to a constant, the, their probability to a constant, and doing this cost of computation for only a subset. Um, and in order to be able to do things really quickly, what we do is we um, maintain a priority <coughs> queue uh, using fast nearest neighbors. So um, I think I'll skip this and go to here. So let's say we have a bunch of individuals. What we do is we, we search for the k nearest neighbor of each individual. So k is a parameter of the algorithm. So let's say two nearest neighbors. We search for the two nearest neighbor of each of these individuals like this, for example, like that, and so on. And then we put them 
on a table like this, right? So we have the na nearest neighbors here. So not every pair is represented in this nearest neighbor uh, table because they don't appear in the nearest neighbor graph. So there is this rest of the pairs. Um, and then we have, we would have had this distribution if we were to evaluate the probability of every pair coalescing. But as I said, we're going to only uh, focus on a subset of pairs. So not even on all the neighboring individuals, but we're going to limit it to uh, a finite number, which I denote here by R. So we will evaluate that integral for these R pairs and for rest of the pairs, regardless whether they appear in the nearest neighbor table or not. We're going to set their value, the, their coalescence probability to a constant vector, a const constant value. And then uh, we'll sample from this distribution. Let's say we sample these guys, then we're going to coalesce them into a new ancestor. Uh, we're going to get rid of the guys that coalesced from the representation and also from the tree, uh, fr from, the, from the priority queue and then include the new guy in the representation. Oops, this is a little messed up, sorry for that. So we're going to include the new guy in the representation. We're going to look for its two nearest neighbors in this case, or K nearest neighbors in general. And we'll decide where to put them in the priority queue. Let's say here and there. Uh, we'll update the priority queue and we'll go on by computing the probability of coalescing for only, only these guys and approximating these as constant and choosing who to coalesce. This time, for example, we chose these guys to coalesce into an individual and so on. So this is how we maintain the priority queue. Okay, so just to... Uh, well, the, these are all these probabilities that you get from that integral are unnormalized probabilities anyway. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you you do you do need to renormalize re everything. So, but again, as I said, when you do that integral, that uh, it doesn't give you a value between zero and one, or a value that like th these won't sum up to one. So you need to uh, renormalize anyway. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, just to go over the algorithm as a whole. So what we do is we maintain a priority queue of pairs according to their distance or their similarity. And at each iteration, what we do is we first, uh, for the first R pairs, we compute the unnormalized probability, this Q of the pair. We set the probability of the rest of the pairs to some constant. Sample a pair to coalesce from that distribution, that stick that I was showing you. And then sample the coalescent time for that pair. We remove merging pairs from the representation and include new ancestor in the representation. Update the priority queue, compute SMC weights, resample particles if they diverge, and if more than one point left, reiterate, okay? So this is the SMC algorithm. The greedy algorithm is basically a really simple variant of this. So we do things deterministically and greedily in the greedy algorithm. Um, we pick the pair with maximum probabilities to coalesce rather than sampling, okay? So rather than using this distribution to sample from, we, we look at the one that's, that has the largest probability, in this, one, uh, in this case, is the second one. So we set that to be the pair to coalesce at that iteration. So this is a deterministic move, given the probabilities. And we set the coalescent time for that pair to the mean of the distribution, rather than sampling from that distribution, okay? So because this is going to be picking deterministically the one with the maximum probability. We don't need to 
worry about setting the probability of the rest of the things to a constant as well, because that constant is going to be smaller than the estimating probability anyway. Um, okay, and the rest is basically, okay, we, we get rid of these parts that have to do with SMC as well, so we get the greedy algorithm. So it's really easy to go to the greedy algorithm once you have the SMC algorithm or the other way around. Okay, so this is what the computational cost breaks down to. So we have, we have a cost of evaluating the integral I was talking about, integrating over the coalescent times for the pair. That is something very costly. So there is this C, which is a very large constant. And then there is this R, which is the number of things that we want to, we decide to do computations for, the top R pairs. And N is the number of individuals in the original population that we started off with. And we still have that N here because there are N minus one iterations until we get to the uh, most recent common ancestor. So this, is, this part is coming from evaluating that integral for R pairs. There is this part, uh, which comes from the nearest neighbor search. So for, I, I wrote this for the KD3, for, for example. Uh, so there is the alpha K factor uh, so for searching for K neighbors. And it takes log N time to search for one neighbor in KD trees or in cover trees as well. And again, there are N iterations. And then there is this R of N, so it is the cost of resampling and it's also a function of N. It depends on the particular resampling <coughs> algorithm that you choose and how often you, you choose to do resampling and so on. So, and you may want to rebalance your KD trees and so on. So uh, all that factors into this R of N. So the dominating factor here, as you can see, is the n log n factor. So this algorithm overall scales with n log n. Uh, compared to the alternative algorithm, so the algorithm that I was talking about before this one scales with a similar C, uh, the cost here. Uh, technically, I shouldn't have written constants in these or equations, but uh, I just wrote them to emphasize that they are really big constants. So there is a C factor coming from evaluating those integrals and then N cube from having to do things over all iterations for every possible pairing. And then there is another algorithm that we de developed that I didn't talk about here, which has better scaling. It, it is quadratic as opposed to cubic with a similar constant. Um, and it manage, manages to do things quadratically uh, in this case because it saves some iterations by, by keeping the coalescent time constant over all iterations. Um, so it, it does things for all possible pairs, but uh, at every iteration, it only needs to do things for the pairs that it hasn't done things before, thing, done, it hasn't done computations for before. Um, Again, if you're interested, we can talk about that later, but just to, just to emphasize that this is doing things by um, keeping some computations that it has done before, so uh, making, being able to make use of those computations, whereas this is doing things more efficiently by avoiding doing some computations, okay? Um, and this is like the <coughs> comparison of overall cost. Okay, so I'm going to go on to some applications. Uh, do we have any guarantee about the colors of sampling in general? Uh, have, you know, to any kind of guarantee, if I do it in a, a random machine, I would be generating yeah. a sample group, what's that of colors? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, I am going to show later uh, a comparison between the quality of samples. Um, the short answer is no, we don't have guarantees for, um, for any SMC algorithm, basically. Um, the more, uh, the rule of thumb is the more particles you have, the better your approximation is going to get. And in theory, only if you have infinitely many particles, you're going to get the correct distribution. But 
uh, experiments show that, at least empirically, um, the quality of samples is uh, pretty good compared to the other algorithms. Um, so all the algorithms that I talked about here are generally, like the, my, my personal experience is that they're generally better than the other algorithms uh, that exist in population genetics that I haven't talked about, um, which actually represents the mutation event and the coalescent event and integrates out the times as opposed to us integrating out the mutations and representing the times. So these algorithms typically produce better samples. Um, plus, if you, if you are interested in how they compare, how these algorithms compare among each other. So the first algorithm I talked about, the, the one that samples times from the prior, as we can imagine, it, it, is, it produces the least efficient samples, simply because it's sampling times from the prior. Um, the last algorithm I talked about, if you look at only one sample, then it is pretty inefficient as well. So it gives you quite bad samples if you only look one uh, look at one sample. But the fact that uh, you can handle a lot more uh, samples because of computation times uh, using this last algorithm I talked about uh, basically ends up ma makes it makes it the best. Uh, performing algorithm, simply because now you can get generate many more samples, you can get rid of the bad samples by uh, resampling, and so you end up getting a better representation of your posterior, but no theoretical guarantees. Um, so we tried KD trees and cover trees. They do have different scaling for different dimensions. KD trees does have a scaling with B, the dimension of the beta, and cover trees have a scaling with um, the something dimension, the doubling dimension or something like that. I don't remember the term now. Um, for the experiments that we did, we didn't see any uh, bad cases, basically. So we, we tried it on different dimensional data. And, huh? Um, so we used 288 was maybe the largest dimension. We might have used more dimensions as well, but at least I, I, I know for sure that we used it on 288 dimensions. Okay. Uh, do you want to give a break? Oh, okay. Excuse me, can you have your next slide? When you might run, is there any one? Or do you not use that new one? Um, so when, when you merge two points into a new one, then uh, you compute the message going from, from the children to the parent <laughs> to get the message of the new <coughs> parent. So basically you represent, uh, remember that plot I was showing you representing everything in terms of kind of distributions? Those, what I meant by the kind of distributions is actually representing in terms of messages. Um, basically, you, you start at the data, you pass messages up the tree, and you have messages representing your uh, internal node. Okay? And we do, uh, we, we do the similarity computations or the distance computations among data points. Basically, uh, whenever I, I say distances between nodes, these are the distances between messages of nodes. Okay? Any other questions? Do you guys need a break or shall I go on? Go on? Okay. <laughs> Was it a no? Break. Break? break? <laughs> okay, speak up. <laughs> okay, a short break.